Hi everyone, my name is Mario Petre. I'm a senior technical support engineer with Click Support. I uh, work out of the Lund office and been with the company for the last five plus years. I hope to uh, share with you some tips and tricks on migrating your uh, ClickSend site to a new environment today. All right, the agenda for today will be uh, reviewing the backup and restore procedures, as well as uh, thinking about some planning and transferring files ahead how to manage your certificates, how to transfer them correctly from site to site, uh, depending on which server you are planning to migrate. Uh, we'll discuss any pitfalls during this process and uh, some tips and tricks and some steps for automating. Now, Mario, my understanding is basically when everything goes right, it's just backup and restore. That's pretty much how things should go when everything's smooth. Where can we find all those specific steps though? Well, you're absolutely right, Troy. Um, we have a step-by-step -step detailed guide on backing up and restoring a site as well as transferring the content over to a new site uh, on our uh, online help page. Okay, so I see we're here on help.click.com under Click Sense for administrators, and we've got the most recent version, September 2020. Yeah, this page contains step-by-step -step, uh, procedures on how to back up your certificates, what other considerations in terms of data transfer you need to pay attention to, such as moving your app content uh, and all the procedures necessary to restoring that site. These instructions can be used either for the purpose of a migration, like we'll be doing today, or as a periodic backup procedure. Yes, backups are, are wonderful because things don't always work as they're supposed to. Real quick, what is the scope of what we're talking about today? We'll be walking you through the process of migrating the central node of a fairly simple environment. We have a central node, we have a service cluster, and we also have a rim node added to the environment. We'll be doing this in virtual machines. In this particular process, it's a VM to VM transfer. The same process would apply if you're moving, for example, from virtual to physical or vice versa, or actually uh, migrating into a cloud provider. Now, why would somebody want to migrate in the first place? There's a few things that can drive that decision. Environment scaling, I, I would say, is the primary one. Okay, why don't we take a look at the environment we're going to be migrating from. What I have here shared with you is the central node of the current environment. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at the QMC. And what version of ClickSense is this? This is our latest version, ClickSense September 2020. We are running on Windows Server 2016 on all machines. Um, as you can see, this machine has gone through a number of migrations and different versions of the monitoring apps. Uh, but we also have some sample uh, applications here. There is a data connection currently to a PostgreSQL server. We also have a RIM node available, a few custom security rules to give access to a stream. And this is how the hub currently looks like. So we'll be shooting for like for like transfer of content and metadata on a new server called send server two, while the old central node will be quote unquote decommissioned, it will no longer be available. Okay, Mario, so how should one get started? Before you actually run through the process, there's quite a bit of planning that I like to do before tackling one of these operations. First of all, I want to know exactly what's in the current environment. Uh, and where things are set up. And the QMC can tell you pretty much everything you need to know about that. Windows itself can tell you everything you need to know about the accounts and uh, the security for these. We'll get started on the online help. That's where I start as well, uh, especially for the backing up and then restoring the database. We don't expect you to remember these by heart. I highly recommend that you familiarize yourself with the steps involved and make sure that uh, you have a simple checklist in place for both the original server as well as the destination, just to make sure that you run through these steps in, a, in an organized fashion. So I have some questions, Mario. We're gonna be migrating, and correct me if I'm wrong, all of our apps, all of our tasks, all of our rules that are set up in the QMC. Will the domain be the same between the two environments? In this particular instance, yes. In the case of the same domain, the process ends up being a lot simpler. Your users will remain intact. However, if the domain changes, there are some considerations. For example, if your user IDs will remain intact on the new domain, let's say you have the exact same user John Doe exists with the exact same John Doe user ID in the new domain, but only the domain part changes. Uh, there are ways that we can approach this. Uh, you can uh, contact professional services, for example, they can help you with a query for your backend system to uh, update all of these records in bulk and resync the accounts to the, uh, to the new domain. If they already exist in Active Directory, it should be as simple as rerunning your user directory sync task once you have modified it with a new domain controller address. 
so that it remaps these uh, users in the background. Is that sync task automatic? The user directory sync task should exist. If you are sw switching domains, my recommendation would be to set up a brand new user directory sync task and configure it with the new domain. Will the account running the services change? That will remain the same. However, if you need to change it, we need to make sure that the new service account has full control file permissions on the service cluster. The account uh, has permission to log on as a service on the new server under local policy and user rights management. And the same account also has to be a member of the ClickSend service users group on the new server. Optionally, you also need to add it to your local administrators group, but of course uh, you can run the services without local admin rights. If you need to upgrade your ClickSense server software, say from version 3.2 to a more modern version like September 2020, as well as upgrading the environment, which should you do first, the software or the hardware? I would tackle the software first, um, mainly for one reason. You, you have probably run ClickSense on this environment for quite a while. Um, this environment is well known to internal IT staff. Its configuration is well known and hopefully very well documented. And if something should go wrong with either the upgrade or the migration, it would be easier for, for support to troubleshoot on an existing system that has known variables and known configuration than troubleshooting on a brand new system. That makes sense. Okay, so as a first step, as referenced in the guide, the first thing we need to take a look at and make sure that we have a, a good backup of our ClickSense certificates. In this particular example, we're gonna be also uh, moving the central node to a new host with a new name. That requires us to issue a set of certificates from the QMC, as well as backing up the current central node certificates manually. Uh, an example of this type of data that is encrypted using your certificates would be connection strings. One example of a, of a connection string that would break without the proper transfer of certificates would be this. This database is running on a separate machine. When the engine tries to access those, those connection details, it will also use their certificates to read that data back, and it may not be able to. So you say we need to export the certificates from here manually. Yeah, so um, as the host name changes for the central node, we will need to issue certificates from the QMC as well as back them up manually. Um, that is because, of course, the, the host name itself changes. If, if, it, if the entire machine, including the host name, would be migrated to a, to a new physical platform, let's say, uh, but the host name is kept, you only need to back up the certificates manually because the issuing authority, as we will see in a moment, won't change. It will still reference the, uh, the central node. The central node always generates and signs all certificates in a ClickSense site. And the number one consideration here is that you have to reference the fully qualified domain name of the new machine. And our target machine will be Send Server 2. So let's go ahead and do that. And these, these certificates, of course, are not uh, the ones used for proxy communication. So the, these are not the certificates that you present to your users via the browser, but rather the certificates that ClickSense Enterprise uses to communicate within its own services. A certificate password is recommended, although not mandatory. We will go ahead and leave this blank for now. However, pay extreme caution to this option. During a site migration, it's mandatory to include the secret key in the uh, trusted root certificate. Otherwise, the certificate chain uh, will be broken and the new system will not be able to validate its own certificates properly. Now, there's a couple of format options there. Do we need to export them in both formats or just which one is more important? Only Windows format is uh, is required, and, and in fact, it's the recommended format. This PM format is a Linux compatible format. For example, if you if you want TLS security between your central node and a Postgres database, like I have set up, you can use those to uh, protect that traffic as well. And I see there's a path there telling us where we're going to export them to. Yep, and this path, by the way, is local to the central node. So uh, let's assume I'm browsing to this address from a client computer. Of course, this path will not be present on the client computer. We'll have to remote in just like we are now into the server and grab it from there. I've copied the uh, the path. We've exported the certificates. Let's go take a look at what was generated. You can see this. Uh, there is a new folder here matching what we've introduced in the uh, machine name for the certificate export. And it contains three certificates, the server, the root, and the client. All three must be transferred over to the new machine. So uh, what I typically like to do is copy them to a different location. Uh, I have a shared folder here set up for this exercise. So we'll paste them in here and leave them as that. Now, 
the next step would be to uh, back to bump manually. And here's a way that you can run Microsoft Management Console as a different user in this particular case, domain backslash QB service. So you can navigate to C Windows uh, System 32, find your MMC executable, shift right click to run as a different user. So we'll add two different snap-ins, one for the current user account. And since we logged in with account that runs the ClickSend services, that will give us access to the right certificate store. The other one is the computer account. And this is where your trusted root certificate will be present. So let's start with the local account first. And these are your machine's trusted root certificates. Your list may be uh, much longer depending on what other trusted root uh, certification authorities your company trusts. But the uh, certificate that is uh, auto-generated by ClickSense will typically have the fully qualified domain name of the machine it was generated on in dash CA format. We'll go ahead and export. We absolutely must export the private key as well. Otherwise, this certificate will not be uh, useful to us on the new machine. We also should export all extended properties to make sure that all current properties in the certificate are transferred over to the new machine. We'll go ahead and set up password so that it lets us export. Is this going to export in the same format as the manual export? Yes, uh, by default, when you're exporting things from Windows' own certificate store, they will always be in uh, PFX format or Windows format as detailed in the QMC. And Mario, what's like the real purpose for exporting manually and through the MMC? Um, the original certificates uh, that we are backing up right now are essentially a worst case scenario recovery tool. The new certificates that we've issued through the QMC will be used on the new server. Again, always export the private key always export extended properties. And your click uh, client certificate as well. The same procedure. Always exporting the private key. Always exporting extended properties. And is this a password that you're kind of making up now, or is it a pre-existing password? It's not an existing password. It's just a password that Windows uses to sort of encrypt the certificate, and it is required when you re-import it. OK. OK, so now with our certificates backed up, it is time to take a note of the service cluster location. This one we can close already. So let's go back to our QMC. Your service cluster is defined here. So if this path changes at all before starting up the uh, services on the new machine, we'll have to make sure that we've uh, verified these settings and have updated the paths um, using a, a small configuration tool that I'll, I'll show you a little later. But for the purposes of this migration, the new machine has access to that share. Yes, and that is, of course, part of your planning as well. Um, you should always test access to all shared resources uh, between these machines. So we've got our service cluster. We've got our certificates backed up. Now, which step actually makes the back of everything in the QMC here? All right, so for that, we'll need to actually back up the uh, repository database that is running in the background. That is based on Postgres, and the details on how to do that are available on, on the help site. Here we can see the step-by-step -step instructions, and we start by stopping the uh, ClickSense services except the ClickSense repository database, as we will access this to uh, take that backup. You will need to open a command prompt with administrative privileges. So copy and paste your um, command line from the help site. However, pay close attention to the uh, destination path for your backup. Ours will be slightly different. And we can talk a little bit about what we are typing here. So PG dump is a uh, built-in command from your Postgres uh, utilities that is available uh, with any installation of ClickSense Enterprise. We're defining the local host uh, as the target host. If you happen to be running on a dedicated Postgres host, this would have to change. Uh, your port, your uh, main user that we'll be using to uh, connect with. This is the user that we defined the super user password for during setup. 
um, and that will be the password that is required and some options for taking the backup. We're using a binary file. Um, we are specifying that the file should be a tarball as we can uh, see the dot tar uh, extension. And the last uh, bit of information here is the database that we wish to uh, backup. So this is not optional. Um, we need to specify QSR as th this is how the uh, database is defined internally. Before we do all that, we'll need to make sure that our services are stopped. So again, we'll be relying on everything but the uh, repository database to be stopped. A quick way to do that is to stop the repository service, which will in turn stop every other service that is dependent upon it, with the exception of the service dispatcher, which we'll have to stop manually. Um, your logging database is unaffected by this process. of Great, so everything's stopped. So now we run the command and that creates the backup of a repository, right? That's right, Troy. A small tip I have for you. When uh, running the backup command, it's always a good idea to use the dash V for verbose flag. This will have a more complete output on your screen about what's going on. And if something should go wrong, we'll be able to catch that before we actually start the services and correct the problem. That's a great tip. It should be the first argument. It's asking for our password. This is again, the super user password that you've defined during installation. And that's it. Our backup should be ready. And here we can see the backup file is present and ready to go. So we have our certificates. We have, along with all the apps and app objects, users, user attributes, your data connections, your tasks. However, please keep in mind that there are special considerations for changing the mains, changing the host name, and moving your service cluster to a new path. But basically, this will put everything back the way it was. Same apps, same list of users, same Active Directory, same tasks. It'll just rebuild it in a new environment with the same database. That's correct. Mario, what happens if we missed one of those steps, like with the certificate, forgot to include the private key or something like that? So let's say the private key is missing. Most likely, the, the repository service will not be able to start fully. And if it is able to start, it won't be able to decrypt all the data in the database. I mean, it's just a checkbox, so it feels like a human error is pretty possible there. Would it actually tell you that you forgot to include the private key? Yes, there is a log file in the following location. So we'll have to go to your log folder under program data. We'll search for the repository trace and the security uh, repository log file will contain information about your secrets and your uh, crypto key access. Okay. Let's say your click client certificate was not exported with its private key. The ultimate effect is that all your data connection passwords won't be decryptable anymore. So let's say you have 15 data connections that use passworded connection string. You will have 30 error messages in, the, in this particular log. Is there anything left to back up or do we move on to the importing process of the new system? There is one more item that I uh, recommend backing up always, and that does require stopping all services, including the repository database. And that is the contents of your program data folder and contains a raw copy of your database. And it also includes your local logs and a couple of other items like your host config. It's good to have in case something goes wrong and the original system is no longer available and must be rebuilt. This is one of the items that you'll use to, uh, to rebuild the system. And that's just a straight up copy of the entire click folder? Yeah. One more item, please consider your custom connector packages, uh, either from Click or a third party provider. If you use uh, ODBC, you will need to recreate these connections on a new server, uh, preferably with the same names so that you do not have to then go in and edit any of your Click scripts um, or modify your existing data connections in the new environment. But aside from that, we now have a full site backup uh, and we're ready to bring this content over to the new machine where ClickSense September 2020 release is already installed. We have decided to create a new cluster with its own database. So there is a uh, Postgres instance on that machine as well so that we can import the data after. So as you can see here, we have all services installed and running under the same uh, service account as uh, Sense Server 1. So what we're looking at right now is just out of a box, install, everything's default. Pretty much fresh and ready to go. This is the first time I'm logging in. It's ready to be licensed. There is nothing okay. going on here. First things first, we will start on the destination machine by importing those certificates. 
I recommend that we start this uh, process by stopping all services. Do we leave the database running? Yes, we'll, we'll take everything down just to make sure that no ports in use, nothing that can uh, prevent us from, from doing what we need to do here. So here I'm accessing the, um, the shared location where we've backed up uh, all of our content. Let's go ahead and import the certificates first. Find your MMC executable. Now, of course, when you set up a new environment or a new server to receive data from an old server, you will have certificates. We'll need to get rid of those as we are importing certificates from an existing environment. And we don't want there to be any clashes inside a certificate store or any duplicate values that may confuse the services when starting up. That makes sense. You want one set of certificates, nothing that might conflict. When you're importing certificates, are there any Windows security rules that might cause problems when you're importing? Absolutely. Good, great point. I'm glad you, uh, you brought that up. Um, new security policies have kicked into place that may prevent services from starting up completely. I'll, I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. Um, there is a local security policy under security options. The policy that we need to look for is under the uh, system cryptography setting. Um, and it's uh, this one, system cry cryptography for strong key protection for user, user keys stored on the computer. If this policy is set up to any of these two last options here on the menu, you will be first prompted to assign a new password that has nothing to do with the password that you've used to encrypt the certificates when backing up. Windows will require you to enter every time you access. It should be set to that first option or not set at all, is that what you're saying? Not set at all, just to make sure that you can at least import the certificate. And mind you, that option has to be disabled only during the short period of time that takes you to import the certificates. You can enable it on the server again after the certificates were imported. Uh, because that policy governs only new certificates. It is not retroactive. That's another great tip. Okay, back to importing. So uh, let's start by importing the trusted root certificate under the local computer account. Uh, and as I mentioned before, since this setup uh, was started, albeit in a blank state, um, the certificates have been generated for the current empty install. So we'll, we'll need to get rid of these uh, to make sure that there are no duplicates. No backup necessary, I'm just gonna go ahead and delete these. Now this uh, new certificate that we didn't see on the origin machine, click service cluster certificate. This is only useful to multi-cloud deployment sites where you are distributing applications to uh, click cloud services. Uh, it is not the case here, so I'm, I'm ignoring that certificate as well. The other certificate that we need to get rid of is uh, click client. That's all gone. We'll go ahead and import them in the right order. Right click here, all tasks and import. The correct store will already be pre-selected and cannot be changed. And we'll go ahead and navigate to our uh, backup location. As this is a complete swap of a central node to a new host name, we'll import the certificates that were manually exported from the original machine. I just want to point out that importing from either certificate backup is correct, but Click recommends using the QMC export with the correctly defined name. And then we'll go ahead and import the uh, server certificate into the personal store. Mark the key as exportable so that uh, you can then mm, take another backup that includes all properties. And since we did not define a password during uh, the export from the QMC, we won't have to specify one here. And the last one is going to be our click client certificate. If you don't see uh, the certificate that you're looking for, uh, just drop down and select all files and select your client cert. But here is another option that users must pay extreme caution to. This first option directly relates to that local security policy that we saw about uh, strongly protecting local client keys. Please do not check this as this will then prompt for a password every time the certificate is being accessed. And of course, we want to make sure that the private key is uh, exportable and we include all the extended properties. And we'll leave it in the personal store. And that's it. Okay. So all those certificates are imported. What's next? Yep. Certificates are in place. What's next? Database operations. First, drop the current empty database. You can drop it 
via PG admin if you have this installed or available via a, a different service, or you can do it via the command line. The uh, steps for the command line are detailed in the help. Uh, however, the steps for PG admin are not, but of course it's a, a it's a more visually appealing tool and easier to use. So let's uh, go ahead and take a look at that. Let's set up a new connection. Our current server is 10.0.0.15. The uh, standard port where the uh, Postgres repository is running is port 4432. The username and the password will be the one defined during setup. There we go. There we go. So as you can see, you have uh, several databases in this uh, database engine. Uh, so this is uh, an easy step, as you can see, we'll, we'll have our schema and our tables. This is where ClickSense stores all of your data or you can use pgadmin to manage your database to take backups and restore. We'll have to drop the table. Of course, you can do that by delete drop. Alternatively, we can use the instructions from the help site. We'll go ahead and copy this content as we've copied it from the help site and drop it in here. Uh, again, we are connecting uh, locally to this current database host with the port and this username, and we are trying to drop the QSR database. No other tasks running in parallel, for example, a backup task running on an automated script. When you're trying to do this, just right click and disconnect the database. Wow. Oh. So let's go ahead and do that now. We've entered the uh, super user password. And there we go. So now going back to PG admin, I'll just go ahead and refresh. And you can see QSR is gone. We'll use the createDB command. Again, connecting locally to the same port with the same username. We'll use the template uh, zero to give us a basic schema backend. However, there will be no tables recreated based on this or anything else. All of that is uh, taken care of by the repository service during the initial startup. So it seeds the database if it's empty. Simple as copy and paste. Right click to paste here. Is there a way to add a uh, dash V to add some verboseness to that so we actually see what happens as well? Yes, I do recommend just as we used uh, dash V for verbose flag during the backup, we will use the same during the restore so that we get an actual feed of um, all the tasks that are, that are being run in the background. So let's go ahead and create this database. Apparently I cannot type in password right now. And there we go. So just to illustrate, we'll go ahead and refresh this again. And here we have a QSR database with a public schema with no tables. So how do we get this data back? Of course, you can still use uh, PG admin to restore your existing file. You would use the restore function and navigate to your tarball and click restore, watch for the progress. We'll go ahead and use the manual method, um, which is defined in our online help. And you can see here I've added a variable path to backup file. I'll copy everything up to that point, and then we'll go ahead and copy the path of the tarball manually. So we'll paste that in here. We have our QSR backup. Again, this is currently sitting on a shared drive. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring this locally. I've created a folder here before I had called QSR backup. And a quick way to grabbing paths from, from existing files is again to shift right click. And there is this wonderful option here, copy as path that already includes double quotes um, so that if this sits in a uh, folder structure with spaces in it, it would work just by copying it and pasting it here, as we can see. It is recommended that you add dash V for verbose output to this command as well. This is where we will spot any, any problems during the import procedure. Before that, let's go ahead and make sure that we're disconnected from the database so that we can use it. And we are ready to hit enter. Yeah, I love that verbose tip. It's so satisfying seeing streams of text scroll across the command prompt. Indeed, you you very seldom do something in the in the command prompt that doesn't offer an immediate output. Yeah, there we go. Creating indexes, constraints, uh, adding foreign key constraints, adding the data. Um, if there were any problems here at the very end of this uh, message, we would see that the proce process, something like process finished successfully with so and so many uh, warnings. We've restored, so now we can verify that the uh, that the data is actually there. Let's refresh, go into our uh, QSR database and look at the tables. 
Whereas previously, uh, just after recreating the database from template, there were no tables. Now we have all, all the content. So now we have our certificates imported. We have all the repository metadata uh, present on the new system. And our RIM node is still active and talking. So we'll try to stand up uh, the services on the new central node. We'll make sure first that the old central node is fully stopped. That's back on sense server one. Yep, that back on sense server one, we'll make sure that everything is stopped. And it is repository database first, service dispatcher second, uh, and the repository service a close third. And we'll be monitoring the activity on this server, uh, on, on that server specifically, just to make sure that everything is uh, coming up as expected. So we'll navigate to our log folder into repository and trace. And you can see here, there's a bunch of new log files. These are automatically rolled over upon service restart. And after reaching a certain point during the startup phase, they will be automatically moved over to your archived logs folder location. If everything goes fine, you will eventually see these files magically disappear. I am comfortable to start bringing up other services such as the engine, proxy, your printing, your scheduler. If you see this in your logs, there is typically one root cause. The repository service at this point, since we have, aha, on purpose missed a step, won't get past this point. The internal host name for the central node inside the ClickSense repository does not match your machine name, nor the machine name for which the certificates were reissued. So Maya, I'm a little confused. Which step did we miss? Uh, we missed the all important bootstrap step. This is a command that you need to run on the new central node that will automatically update the hostname values for the new central node in the, inside the database and also recreate any certificates that are, that are necessary based on the trusted root certificate available on the machine. So let's go ahead and run through this process now. We'll have to put it in bootstrap mode, run it in standalone so that it runs through this special mode and then restore hostname is the special command that we need to use to make sure that the internal values are updated. Of course, need to make sure that the repository service is stopped and every other service is stopped on the machine other than the repository database. The service dispatcher does not. Crossing my fingers. So this will uh, recreate any certificates that are missing and also bind them to the appropriate services. Um, and once it enters main startup phase, uh, it will exit out again. And at that point, uh, we should be comfortable that uh, the database has been one fully restored and two uh, properly configured to operate on this new machine. So once again, and this time for good, let's uh, start things up and we'll once more monitor the uh, startup procedure to make sure that everything is running smoothly. And real quick again, what is the um, order for starting up the services? Service dispatcher first, repository database, um, repository service, let that run for a few seconds, uh, make sure that things are starting up correctly by looking at the file and then um, everything else. Of course, the logging, uh, the logging uh, service database, I have to start that before anything else as well, um, and as this one is independent from all other services. Um, but the, my preferred order afterwards, after repository service is fully running, is to go engine, proxy, scheduler, printing. Here we go. A uh, nice and clean folder here means all of our previously generated log files were successfully archived. That means our service cluster is fully accessible by the new system. We have the right permission set up for the uh, service user. So are we at that glorious point where we get to check the hub? Yes, sir. Yes, we are. Let's uh, log in into the QMC first. And we have a platform. Let's check the node status again. 
these are still talking to each other, still five by five on the rim node. It looks just like it did. So the final test, dealing with existing data connections that have credentials associated with them. One quick test uh, is to just run one of those uh, reload tasks and see if we can get the app again. Uh, so for that, let's just go to the hub or authenticated. We can see our applications. Let's go look at our Postgres SQL data test. Now this is an app just to sort of test that data connection you've set up? That's correct, that's correct. It's currently set up to reload once a day, uh, but we can trigger this manually real quick just to uh, make sure that the, uh, the timestamp is updated. Let's go ahead and reload that task and make sure it's still running. It already finished. Let us data reload 12.35. So everything seems to be working so far. There are a number of other considerations that we didn't touch on today. The bulk of the time taken here is prep work and then actually uh, backing up your content. We recommend a maintenance window for any such procedure. Are there any resources available to make this process easier? Here's some uh, documentation on how to uh, set up ClickSense from scratch using the silent install method. That's for setting up. In terms of automating the backing up and restoring of the environment, a simple PowerShell script that triggers the uh, PG backup and the PG restore command on the target server would be enough. Here's a great place to start for what happens next. This will set you up with great activities to run on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and yearly basis. Of, but I highly encourage you all sense admins to start here and familiarize yourself with this content. And with that, that was it for me. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Troy? Now it's time for Q&A. Go ahead and place your questions, anything you, questions you might have in the Q&A panel on the left side of your own 24 console. Mario, which question would you like to address first? Well, Troy, there's a, a very interesting question here about update sequence. Um, somebody is asking when upgrading a multi-node ClickSense environment, can you go straight to the latest update or is it best practice to install updates sequentially? Um, I'm not sure if everyone is aware uh, about this, but all of our updates are cumulative. Um, so if you jump between two major feature releases, uh, let's say between April and September, you will also get all the content that was delivered in the June release, uh, which was skipped. So there is no need to do sequential updates. Um, however, be careful uh, with how big a jump you're making between, between versions. Um, for the very, very old versions, there are some special considerations. However, when moving between modern versions post um, feature releases in, in 2018, you can just jump over to the uh, to the latest. Um, I would suggest that the bigger jump you make, uh, the more testing and validation you should do to make sure that everything in the system works fine, including applications and their objects, as we, um, we have made quite a few changes in the recent releases and added new content. Uh, but other than that, mm, yep, you can, uh, you can jump straight to the, uh, to the latest. The same applies for patches, by the way. So uh, you can go from patch one to patch five knowing that everything on two, three, and four is also included. Okay, next one. All right, uh, let's see. What uh, special considerations are there if we're migrating from a physical server to an AWS environment? Um, well, pretty much all the networking considerations they have in a Windows environment, uh, physical on-prem, except you will have to deal with AWS's uh, networking services, network load balancer, etc., and make sure that the um, access route that users are going to take to reach your system is uh, fully open and configured to accept uh, connections for ClickSense. Um, if, uh, if there are any doubts about how to, how to achieve this or something isn't working as expected, uh, feel free to contact ClickSupport. We'd love to take a look and uh, help you out. All right, uh, let's see, a bunch of really interesting questions here. Um, yeah, someone uh, is mentioning that uh, there's a new certificate that showed up during the uh, presentation um, that we haven't seen before. This is called ClickSense, uh, uh, Click Service Cluster, sorry. And um, it's a brand new certificate introduced in the September 2020 release. And this is used for um, multi-cloud environments that have a Windows on-prem installation and want to distribute apps to uh, a Kubernetes uh, install or to our own ClickCloud services. Um, and just as uh, 
the rest of the certificates, this one also has to be backed up during a migration process or during your normal backup procedures um, and will have to be restored as well in the case of a migration. Um, the uh, help uh, click help site has been updated to reflect this step as well. So if you follow those procedures, you'll be fully covered on certificate backup and restore. And uh, another short question, um, what about using block storage? Um, if you're referring to the service cluster, um, using block storage there is not advised as we'll, we'll need um, NTFS file policies to be, uh, to be enforced, which means the file share uh, hosting your service cluster should be hosted by a Windows box um, just acting as a file server so that you can always uh, keep permissions under control and it's easier to troubleshoot. We also support um, certain type of NAS configurations provided that the uh, permission layer of NTFS or SMB protocol is um, the very latest one used and there are no restrictions to file access. Um, the reason why this is a, a new change is that in, in the old days, uh, smaller capacity NAS boxes, for example, would have restrictions such as file listing. Um, so this is something to keep in mind. But for block storage specifically, um, we don't currently support this uh, as far as I'm aware. Um, because it does not support the NTFS permission layer and our product relies on it to, um, to control access to files. However, um, I do recommend that in um, cloud providers, in your virtual cloud provider, you, you try to deploy um, instances with flash storage wherever um, file hosting is, uh, is going to be placed. And, and that is especially important for the server that hosts your service cluster. Um, Flash-based storage is going to be faster than, uh, than hard drives, and it will help performance as well as uh, access times to, uh, to smaller apps. Um, and someone is asking if uh, the process that we've walked through today is the same as for migrating ClickView server. Um, and the short answer is no. Um, these two procedures are, of course, very, very different uh, because the products are very, very different. Um, if you want to know more about how to migrate a ClickView server correctly uh, from machine to machine, please refer to our online help and knowledge base articles that are present on uh, Click Community. And again, for any issues uh, that may occur during that process, contact Click Support. Uh, yeah, there's there's a couple here uh, that have to do with uh, changes to apps after such a migration. Uh, there's one asking about apps needing to be imported individually. Um, of course not. Um, in the presentation, we saw a, a migration process that did not involve moving the service cluster over to a new location. Um, however, the service cluster hosts all of your apps and, and other app metadata uh, that is not present in, in the database. So by directing your new environment to an existing file share that hosts the service cluster or by moving those files across, you are essentially moving all of your apps over. So you won't have to import them into the QMC one by one. Uh, and the other question is um, for the operations monitor and other monitoring apps available in, in the system, can they be configured to read from the previous uh, environment logs as well as the new ones? And the answer is yes, of course. Um, all you have to do is go into your um, into your system, enable a security rule so that one of your root admins or one of your administrators can see all of the uh, backend REST connections um, and the uh, the folder connections, and just create one for the uh, for the new location. However, for the old logs, um, the old logs will also be present in your QVDs as they get reloaded on the old system. QVDs would have been generated, so if you move those across to a location where the uh, current monitoring apps can can access them that data will still be present. So you're not gonna have a clean split between um, uh, between data in these monitoring apps unless you get rid of the old QVDs or never import them, let's say, uh, and just reload on the new environment from scratch. That would then only show you the, uh, the new environment data. Okay, Mario, we have time for one last question. All right, so um, somebody's asking here about upgrading from an old version of ClickSense, say 3.2 to the latest, which would be uh, September 2020, um, as well as upgrading their hardware at the same time. This um, this type of migration, uh, I would raise quite a lot of caution here. This is a huge jump, and many back-end modifications have happened in the product since uh, ClickSense 3.2, or the numbered versions. Um, there are uh, very detailed articles on, on click support and, and click community on how to do this correctly. It involves jumping to a intermediary version um, somewhere 
slightly more modern than ClickSense 3.2, but not quite as recent as one of the 2020 releases. Um, and then from that point onward, you can jump over to any of the, uh, the latest releases. Uh, however, as advised during the presentation, I would first tackle the product upgrade validate that everything is still working as expected, correct any issues that you see there, and then once happy with the performance of, uh, of the existing system, at least on the new version, considering any hardware limitations, um, I, I would then um, start planning the migration to, to new hardware. All right, so that was, uh, that was it for today. Thank you all very much for joining us and submitting your questions. Uh, this has been a blast and looking forward to the next one. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. We hope you enjoyed this session, and thank you to Mario for presenting. We appreciate getting experts like Mario to share with us. Here's our legal disclaimer, and thank you once again. Have a great rest of your day.